we have to actually be really skilled at operating our own human system. So that's kind of what we call our internal operating system. It's that mix of our belief systems, the thoughts, the emotions, the behavioral patterns that we're running on every day that ultimately impact the visible results that we produce. They've been doing 40 years of incredible research on the power of the heart, and they use this word coherence. They really define coherence as this optimal state in which the heart, mind, and emotions are aligned and in sync. It's where the nervous, hormonal, and immune systems function in a state of energetic coordination. We always say it's like your optimal operational state. It's flow. When people can't be their authentic selves, then they get sick their brain shut down. It just goes on and on and on. So when you can create a culture of trust, authenticity, safety, their personal lives flourish, their professional lives, their performance, everything. Hello and welcome to Tuesdays with Morrissey, where we share insights from great thinkers. Today, I'm excited to be joined by Kiki Federico and Jeff Benton of Paragon Performance. Jeff and Kiki, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Excited to be here. At Paragon, you train executives, astronauts, pro athletes, corporations, and even sometimes high schoolers on the art and science of evolving what you guys call the internal op operating system. And, it, as, as, and you consider it to be the number one skill to unlock optimum health, clarity, relational intelligence, and creative potential. For those who might not be familiar with the concept of an internal operating system, how do you guys define that? Great question. Um, yeah, I think it's important for us to just start with the broader context that we find ourselves in. So, um, you know, obviously we work with a lot of companies. We work with people who are pro athletes um, at the top of their game. And, you know, I think that um, in the past, we used to live in a world where, you know, just being good at our jobs was enough to be successful. And just by virtue of the way that society is changing, the economy is changing, technology is changing, where we're seeing, you know, an exponential amount of technology, um, you know, the, the, the role that we have to play, it's no longer enough to essentially be good at our jobs. We have to actually be really skilled at operating our own you know, our own human system. So that's kind of what we call our internal operating system. It's that mix of our belief systems, the thoughts, the emotions, the behavioral patterns that we're running on every day um, that ultimately impact the visible results that we produce. And when we work in an organization or with a team, what we know from things like systems theory or organizational science is that the visible results, while it's easy to stay really focused on those, they're ultimately produced by the underlying behavior patterns. And then beneath that, the thoughts, the, the values, the belief systems that people are running on. So we really go to the root at Paragon versus stay um, focused on the things that are most visible. And that's what we call the internal operating system. And Adam, I, I was gonna jump in uh, also, I you know, kind of a la Dr. Joe Dispenza, you know, our operating system is already sort of preloaded, right? Uh, from the age of seven. So our brain is really a record of the past. And I think in our world, we know this stuff, but when I tell clients that 90% of our thoughts were the same as the day before, 60 to, or we have 60 to 70,000 thoughts, 90% the same as the day before, 70 to 80% are either harmful or negative. And then 95% of our thoughts are being run by the subconscious, right? And so with this operating system, like Kiki said, if we don't intentionally become aware of our behaviors, our baselines, right? Our belief systems, then we're basically recreating a known past into a predictable future. And so I mean, we, we, we always joke, we always show the picture of uh, Puxatani Phil, right? In Groundhog Day, but it's exactly the way we are programmed, right? And, and that's how we become a victim and, and so forth. So Kiki said it much more eloquently, but yeah, it's, it's an operating system that until we create greater awareness, we're just living out the same story every day. I've heard it said a lot of what happens in life is outward expressions of inward beliefs. 
And even the things that come back to us are patterns until we learn whatever lesson. What I really like about the concept of the operating system is the, the, the idea of functioning well. One of my guests, uh, Dr. Corey Keyes at Emory, is one of the leading scientists on the concept of human flourishing. And his one of his big things is shifting from success measured by outward achievement to success as a byproduct of functioning well. So when I hear the term operating system, I think functioning well. One other concept I wanted to get um, your guys' input or definition on is coherence. That's something from reviewing your work. I, it's a word I've seen come up a lot, but it's not necessarily a word we hear very much on a day-to-day. -day. How do you guys think about the concept of coherence? Um, well, I first heard the word coherence um, from our partners at HeartMath. And I, Adam, I'm not sure if you are familiar with Heart, the HeartMath Institute, but they've been doing 40 years of incredible research, peer-reviewed studies, right, on the power of the heart. And they use this word coherence. And they really define coherence as this optimal state, I think, in which the heart, mind, and emotions are aligned and in sync. And really, from a physiological standpoint, it's where the nervous, hormonal, and immune systems function in a state of energetic coordination. And so we always say it's a coherence is like your optimal operational state, it's flow. And ultimate coherence is, you know, when you talk to an athlete and musician and everything slows down, right? And the basket looks twice as big. And I would say the opposite mm -hmm. of coherence is when we're in a stressed out state. And when we're in a stress response or, you know, fight or flight, which a lot of us know, what happens is our operating system is not working at full capacity, right? So we're in a stress response and it literally limits key brain functions, including our frontal cortex, right? Which kind of separates us from other animals. And we truly become limited in our ability to think clearly communicate, problem solve, have empathy and connect with other people. So when we can actually have the awareness and one of the things Kiki and I do is teach our clients these tools and techniques to shift into a coherent state, then they optimize the operational system. They're able to um, maximize the brain capacity, right? In this human system. And it's amazing. And I would say one of the things that is unique to us because of the heart math teachings and our other partners is the tools and techniques that we teach are meant to be uh, used in real time in the moment and with your eyes open. And I think that's why uh, it's been so well received from special forces to nurses, to astronauts, to pro athletes. And, you know, when, our clients feel the coherence within a couple minutes. It's the ultimate evidence that gives us credibility for them to then be on the journey with us. And also, you know, when we talk to heart math and we have some doctors on our team, there's, they say there's only really a few ways to get into this coherent state. Um, one is when you do the heart focused breathing and you put your attention in the area of your heart, it actually sends different neural signals to the brain that optimize the key brain functions. And the other way is when you actually feel a positive renewing emotion, right? When you do that, 1400 changes happen in the body. All these magical chemicals get created, including DHEA, which is the vitality hormone. And that is where we are truly the creators of our own world. Right. I mean, I, I don't, I could keep going on this, but, um, you know, I think so many of us, because the operating system in the past beliefs either feel like if we're feeling a positive renewing emotion, we're vulnerable or we don't deserve it. Right. And mm -hmm. as we take them through the journey and explain this coherent, you know, that they can do this, it literally changes their life. I'm excited to have more conversations around coherence, how to get in a state of coherence and the internal. Before we do that, I want to talk a little bit more about the external. The problem with programming is to shift it, you're going to have to face inertia. 
And one of our programs, I think everyone learns probably by the way we were raised with things like timeout and the reward system is, and such is focused on the external and outcome orientation. Why is it so tempting for us to focus on these more visible outcome oriented things, even if in conversations like this and others, we're continuously reinforced that the internal is really the thing we need to be focusing on? Yeah, I mean, I think the the temptation there is to focus on thing, a thing we think is going to get us the most immediate reward. And we see it all the time. I mean, when we talk with leaders and VCs, there is a lot of temptation to when like team dynamics or, you know, they want to make a change in the organization to focus on things like aligning the team around KPIs, um, focusing on strategy, messaging, even getting people in the right roles. But the in the, the thing about the internal is it is less visible. So unless we're actually aware of what we're thinking, what we're feeling, and are perceiving the impact that that's having in creating our outcomes, unless we're actually doing the work to connect those dots, it's easy to stay focused on trying to change the external. So that's a big reason why the first step in the work that we do, you can think about like coming into a state of coherence, it's kind of like putting the car in neutral before you want to, you know, go into a different direction is to, to, to get into that more regulated state to actually gain greater awareness over the thoughts we're thinking, the emotions we're having, the belief systems and the mindsets that we're carrying. But once those things are made visible, it creates a lot of aha moments. And, you know, the reality is too, Adam, like, you know, we've all worked in teams where there's been a lot of stressed out people. They may not be able to see what their impact is, but it's certainly palpable and felt by all the people around them. And we're all doing that with each other every single day. Um, so I think that, you know, the, in the past, we might've actually had more of a luxury to focus on the externals, but the, there's something happening with the way that the world is speeding up our understanding from more of a psychological perspective about how our internal reality creates these outer results, um, where it's harder and harder for us to look past these. And, you know, one of the things we talk about here at Paragon is that, you know, as traditional lanes of success have shifted, um, we've moved out of an information economy where the more that you win, the more you know, the more that you win. Um, and we're in this rapidly changing world that's really marked by infinite choice. It's an age of agency where we have to constantly make decisions about who we're going to be and what we're going to say and how we're going to act. Um, you know, we really see for a lot of our clients that the imperative is, like you said, not just to function well, but to become intentional creators of our external reality. And I think, you know, we can, you know, see that just in like pop culture with the rise of things like manifestation and, um, you know, people really needing to take the reins over their internal environment to create their external resu results. But with what's happening economically, socially, culturally, I think the stakes are getting even higher um, for individuals and for teams to start actually doing that work together to reduce friction um, and to re reduce the lag time that's caused by ignoring the invisible internal and start to actually put the focus there. You know, when you're describing the, um, how you might not be able to see it yourself, but other people can see it. The vision that comes to mind is a house with a light on inside when it's dark outside. People can see in, but you can't see out. And that's like the visual that comes to mind when I'm thinking about the stressed out state, which would be the, the difference between coherence. Yeah, I, I, I was just gonna add one other thing, like and Kiki said it so well, we built a society that the value is all external, right? And so that's how we get rewarded. And I mean, again, when we go back to the operational system when we're kids, I know for me and a lot of high performing individuals, the way we got love is when we performed externally, right? And then the last hundred years, even our society and culture has shifted where money and power, that that has become sort of the, the 
the evolution of this success? I think you raise a great point, Jeff. And, um, you know, I can I can relate to that archetype of, of being validated for external performance. But I think as things are getting more complex and as the world's speeding up, what we're finding, I mean, in our personal lives, but also with our clients is that essentially like the our bodies are starting to uh, speak to us. You know, we're seeing obviously exhaustion, burnout, where there's literally it's 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 happening just in culture that we kind of can't keep going on the same. Uh, that's why we say it's important to upgrade or evolve that internal operating system because the same patterns or the same strategies to get the results are kind of starting to fail us. So we're needing to actually be more smart about how we create those external results. Yeah, just the demands of people are so much higher from even think about just as simple as the shift from letters to emails to text messages. Like you need to evolve and, and find ways to reduce because that's just unlimited more stressors that were there before. Sure, there were probably some immediate stressors where we've gotten more comfortable with food and shelter for the majority of people. Um, you know, you mentioned like the rise of things like manifestation. Like one thing that I'm observing and I'm curious about is like not all the info on these topics are the same. How do you guys think about the volume of material out there about changing your internal state, changing your vibration, manifesting that might not actually be serving people. Yeah, that it, this, I'm still on this journey. And um, I think for a long time, well, I would say recently when I got introduced sort of to more spiritual principles, I think it was, it was eye-opening and it was a heart opener. But I also think I started to want to avoid anything that didn't feel good you know the spiritual bypassing and mm -hmm. what happened is it would either manifest in other ways or when i didn't feel good i had a lot of judgment against myself and so that would play out so i was i was telling kiki 2024 has been all around feeling emotions so I've been part of, you know, I don't know if you know, IFS therapy and Dick Schwartz, mm -hmm. who would be a great yeah. guest and just somatic and really around connection. And it's really changed my lens to how I talk to clients because we would always talk about this path of self mastery, right? And how we've got to learn awareness of our thoughts and emotions and have tools and techniques. We have changed that to now this path of self-awareness. Because when you're on a path of self-mastery, then there's a good and a bad. So the days you show up and you're angry or you yell at your spouse, that's not self-mastery. So it creates a division of judgment. So now when we go in with the operating system and we talk about self-awareness, it's always progress. So even if you yell at your spouse or your kid, when you have that awareness and you can process it and take ownership of it, that is still moving forward. And ultimately that is self mastery, right? But we've just changed it to self-awareness and there's so much information in feeling what we're feeling, right? I mean, that is really the gold. And when we can take ownership and move through it. And so, yeah, so when you're asking that, you know, I would say two things. One, the spiritual bypassing, you know, of not feeling your emotions, it's self-destructive. And then two, this kind of what I think BS belief of just think it and it will happen. It really is deceptive. I mean, one is, um, I would say from a 3D standpoint, we got to work our butts off and it really helps to be in purpose, right? And understand our passion. That's when miracles can happen. And I would say from a more metaphysical standpoint, what we have found within our community and other communities is when you have a vision, right, your brain, and you can actually feel the emotions as if they're already happening, there is some quantum formula, and I have no idea what it is, but it works for our CEOs, for, for the high school kids and others. And we have a group separate called Transformational Healing Alliance. And we started it uh, when the pandemic happened because there was so much fear and anxiety 
and we just wanted our global community to come together, one, to teach them how to get out of a stress response, right? Two is to create community because there was so much loneliness. And we've been doing it a couple days a week for four years. And it's about teaching people how to feel emotions, get incoherent. We have seen miracle after miracle after miracle, so much so that we now have a, a PhD on our team that was at Harvard Medical School doing research, and she's doing white papers for us, trying to figure it out. And so I say that because there is, you know, when we, there is something beyond this, you know, within this quantum field where we get very clear on intentions and feel these emotions of love and whatever, and something more powerful than ourselves can happen. I like the distinction you made between self-mastery and awareness. And awareness, ultimately, as you described, becomes a path to self-mastery. I think that I've seen the same thing is a lot of these believe, these stories and tips and tricks that are kind of quick fixes continue to reinforce separateness. Mm, yes. And I think the real path is trying and failing and trying again. And that's really, you're, you know, I, I heard it described every thought is either the creation of a new neural pathway or deepening an existing one. And if you're going to create a new neural pathway, you're basically building a trench and it's going to have to take a lot of re re repetition to make it. And then I, I really like what you're saying. You know, it seems like it's very new that we have this belief that life is supposed to be easy. Like I, as you were sharing that, I was thinking about the last 160 years, you know, it would take in America, you got the civil war, not easy for anybody. You got, you know, more immigration, you know, you have two world wars, a depression. And then, you know, in the last you know, 40 years, maybe it's been, there's been some uh, economic surplus and some uh, quality of life increases, but it's a pretty new thing that we think it's going to be easy because it, it doesn't seem like it's ever been easy before, but it's funny how quickly we get used to some of this mm. stuff and we can shift our stories really quickly too. Yeah, very much. And I, can I just, I just had one of you inspired something. And again, I, I want to keep giving people credit. Like I do some work with Joe Hudson. I don't know if you know the art of accomplishment and it's really powerful. And one of the things he's really been the inspiration around the self-awareness versus self-mastery. And one of the things he has you do or has his group do is if you're dealing with some sort of challenge, like not creating abundance or not finding the love you want. He's like, write down 30 experiments and go through them, right? And just fail as mm. fast as you can. Because people, you know, they, they want to lose weight. They go to the gym one day. They don't go the next day. They're discouraged, right? So it's write 30 things down, have self-awareness, and just be curious about it and keep moving forward with that. So I just, I, I wanted to mention that because of what you said. Yeah, action, contemplation and action. And from what you're describing about how much of our thoughts are repetitive, we spend too much time in contemplation for a lot of people. And, you know, other people spend probably too much time in yeah. action. And the reality is you need both. And everybody's got a little, a little bit of a dis different lessons. I want to talk about success stories and the miracles you've seen. But before we do, can you share one of the methods that really seems to work well to help people shift from a, a state of stress to coherence. Absolutely. Yeah. You want to try one right now, Adam? <laughs> yeah, okay. please. Let's do it. Yeah, I'd love to. <laughs> Cause I found myself this morning. I was, I just got back from a trip and I was like, if I can just complete all these things on this list, I will be less stressed. <laughs> and it, it, it didn't work. Okay. Well, let's see if we can get you into a state where you can at least uh, glide from one to the other. So um, you can even leave your eyes open. We can show each other, you know, we can show the audience what it looks like to do this with eyes open. So um, just start to take some nice, easy inhales and nice, easy exhales. <sighs> you can imagine that, you know, you're on a webinar, you're on a Zoom meeting. No one has to even know. Podcast, podcast recording. recording. No one even has to know what you're doing. And uh, you can just start to imagine that your breath is flowing Nice and easy. Make about a count of five in. And a count of five out. And just start to imagine that you can draw the air in through the point in the center of the chest.
And it's flowing in and out from that point as if that's the only place that the air can flow in and out from. And then the last thing we'll do is just activate the thought of a memory, a knowing something maybe you're even excited about that brings up a positive and renewing emotion. So that could be gratitude, joy, love, sense of compassion. And just start to feel when you breathe with the air going through the heart, just start to feel that amplify. Simple. Very simple and, and noticeable too. I was having flashes of gratitude and momentum and was also thinking about Gay and Katie Hendricks's concept of the upper limit mm -hmm. problem. Thinking like, you know, if we keep acting without regulating, mm -hmm. eventually we'll probably be, I, I don't actually have the words for it, but that, that was what I was thinking about. I was thinking about this concept of the upper, upper limit problem. Could you speak to how this fits in with something like an upper limit problem? Absolutely. I mean, I think you mentioned something really astute before in terms of the thoughts. You're either creating new neural pathways or you're in the same old grooves. And when we're in a state of dysregulation, we're firing on the old neural network. When we move into a state of regulation, that's actually when we can lay down the new tracks in our, in our neural networks. That's when we can actually start to take action from a different uh, set of beliefs and from a different state and therefore creates different outcomes and creates mm -hmm. different feedback for us to then observe different results to give our, you know, uh, you know, through our eyes an actual uh, revised experience. Yeah, when we're stressed, when we're tired, those grooves are even easier for our thoughts to get into and our outcomes will continue to be the same. I was reading uh, Peter uh, Peter Levine's Waking the Tiger about traumas and stress responses and stuff. And I know from my experience, you know, uh, trying to be aware is sometimes something will come in. And, you know, I, I picture it like a wave. It might be like a one or two inch wave and you have the tools and tricks to regulate and address it and show up the way you want. But other times, whether it's a really big trigger or you're not at your best or you're stressed or you're tired, that wave feels 10 feet tall. And I know in my experience, I don't feel like I have the tools. Like I just drop all my tools and brace for impact with the wave. <laughs> yeah. We like to give people the tools and not just individuals, but teams. You know, I think one of the things that's also unique about this time that we're in is that, you know, as we are doing this work, we're becoming more aware we're all becoming more perceptive. I think we're all starting to be able to see, sense, and feel more. And so the way I like to think about it is like, we're all nodes on the human network. And, you know, it's even said in physics that a small pool of coherence in a field of chaos actually starts to bring more coherence into the whole system. And so I like to think about that from a people perspective, because when we're on a team, we can start to think about if we actually start to hold the frequency or we start to become a little more coherent, you can think of it like a subtle intervention. We can start to subtly influence the other people on our team. We kind of become a better node on the human network. And it's advantageous for us because if we think about ourselves as a human system, we haven't you know, we're, we're a singular, you know, united being, but we're also made up of these interlocking systems between our physiology, our emotions, our brain, you know, uh, whatever else animates us. And when we're in a state of coherence, those interlocking systems are actually communicating more efficiently. There's 
higher quality, higher fidelity, and higher speeds of data and information that's flowing within our own system, which means we have more clear thinking, more access to intuition. We're actually picking up and receiving more of the information and intelligence that's available in ourselves. And then when we come together as a team to do that, we're collectively actually operating at a higher level of shared intelligence because each person is more aware of what's going on inside of them. And each person is more aware of the the true information that's available in the field in the present moment. So when you're in a conversation with your co-founders or your teams, the ideas that are hitting the table, uh, the safety that's created amongst people because everyone's in tune uh, the truthful conversations that can happen and thus the ideas, solutions, creative ideas that emerge from that place um, are going to be much more enriched and have much higher quality inputs going into them, which you can imagine if we commit to doing that together, the like uh, the the wasted time and energy, the doubling back on things, the relational friction and, and all that that can be avoided we all become a lot more energy efficient, um, a lot more really connected with each other, a lot more honest, a lot more trust is built. And what we're creating is, is you know, coming from a higher quality data source. So that's kind of like the, the ultimate <laughs> vision. And then we have more energy to go do things that we love. Um, but I know we've got a great example of some of the clients that we've done this with. Yeah, I want to talk about those. I really like what you're saying about individual responsibility and the power of right small actions. I think Gay and Katie, when they were on the show, they said it only takes one action to shift a pattern. And when you were sharing that, I was reminded one of my favorite movies is Casablanca. And one of my favorite books is Gentleman in Moscow by Moore Tolls. And in Gentlemen in Moscow, the characters are doing a study of Casablanca, specifically one scene where the German officers come in and completely tear up Rick's cafe. And as Rick's walking through the dining room, he shifts one piece of glassware sideways to upright as he's walking past the table as to signify that one small action can help restore mm, order. Love that. That's powerful. It's fun. Can you guys share some success stories about what teams and, and individuals start to experience when they um, incorporate coherence as part of their practice? Yeah, it's it's powerful. I, I actually get emotional now thinking about it, but um, this has happened multiple times now. Um, and it's a lot of times it's with senior teams that we start with. First of all, We'll have leaders come in and say, can you do work with our teams? Can you change the culture? And then we're like, yeah, but you're going to be a part of it. Because how a leader shows up is almost more impactful than each individual and them making changes. And so we have this, what we call a process of evolution. And it goes from self-evolution to team evolution to community evolution. And so just to set it up, we used to do a lot of team stuff. And we'd go in and do team dynamics, everybody would feel good, get great ratings, and then everybody go back to the same baselines, right, the next day. So now when we work with teams, it is the first piece, the first couple months is around self-evolution. And it's all about them having greater awareness of their thoughts and emotions. So we do tons of exercises around identifying baselines, behaviors, uh, all of that over and over and over. They're like, why are we doing it again? But again, it's building those new neural, new neural networks. So when those opportunities or situations come up, they actually can identify it, right? They can get past the 95% of the subconscious and be conscious about their actions. And the most important thing is having each individual on the team take ownership of their own potential, right? When that happens and when you get a team that starts to identify their own behaviors, they take responsibility for their own actions. Then when we go into the next piece, which is the uh, team evolution, it's around trust, safety, vulnerability, communication. That's where we see them start to expand time, right? And miracles happen because then they can connect at a deeper level 
And when we can get them out of the stress response into this coherent state, they're able to actually be vulnerable and authentic at a deeper level. And so, you know, a number of clients, I think about Cornell working with their senior HR team, you know, they, they had a, you know, a certain culture there. And then they had a new CHRO come in, who's an amazing woman who brought us in and we did the self evolution. But also one of the things we did is we did a lot of exercises around gratitude for each other and for the team. And the reason we did that is the team was in a stress response for many years before. And when you're in stress, you look at everything as survival. And then when you're in that survival mode, you look at things as a threat, including your senior team members, right? It's just, we've seen it over and over. So when things are challenging, stressful, changing, people go into their own silos and protect their own turf. And so with, with Cornell and a number of other clients, after we finished the six month program and we go, we're, we're in person and we go around the room and we kind of do a key takeaway and an appreciation, almost everybody in the room said one of the biggest changes is now when things are really stressful and the house is on fire, we actually all come together and work together and collaborate versus going into our own silos and protecting our turf. That is huge, right? I mean, and that is really how you increase performance. I mean, there's so many positives with that, right? Because when people can't be their authentic selves, then they get sick, their brain shut down, it just goes on and on and on. So when you can create a culture of trust, authenticity, safety, their personal lives flourish, their professional lives, their performance, everything. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest challenge for leadership development firms is making it sustainable. And the fact that with the heart math and that paragon, you guys have something you can do repeatedly and quickly to get back into a state where you can work from is really, really powerful to help with that. Cause you get that quick response that you mentioned earlier, Jeff. I mean, when you go into teams and help people be more human at work, have greater coherence, like I can't imagine it's all sunshine <laughs> and lollipops. I imagine like, this is when some people quit. Some people get like, figure out like, this isn't the right place for them in, in what could be a really positive yes. way. But could you share a little bit about what happens yes. when teams cross this threshold? Yeah. And Kiki jump here, but it, when we go in to a company, we said, we're here to serve the individuals and not the company sort of agenda because we need the freedom, right. To have the confidentiality. So the first thing, like we did a workshop last week in Oklahoma City for a government agency, and we say a third of you are going to think this is directly for you. You've been asking for it. A third of you are going to think that it's interesting. Thirty of you are going to think that we're crazy, right? But as we start to get you know people self-regulated and into their hearts, they actually start to identify with their true authentic selves. It's just how we are wired. And so when we do the work, a certain amount of individuals on a team, and it's not always, but I would always say one or two, start to get regulated enough and get out of the stress response. And they access parts of their brain that allow for them to connect with their real selves, like just from a scientific standpoint. And they realize it's not their purpose and passion and they go explore other things. But I think more importantly is we start to help to create an environment where people can be present, grateful, more loving, and then that enables them to speak their truth, right? They take the courage to do it, and then every time they do it and they realize their world's not gonna blow up when they speak their truth in a loving way, it empowers them and it empowers the team because, you know, one of the things we've seen is these nice cultures where everybody nice, nice to each other, they're doomed, right? Because nobody's speaking their truth. They're talking behind their backs, right? And so there's all these different gifts. And also as we do the work, 
we have all these beautiful stories on a regular basis of how they're taking it um, home and they're seeing shifts with their their spouses and their children and and all of that. But um, yeah, I mean, we, I, I would say at a higher level, we, we do high performance leadership team dynamics, but that's really a Trojan horse. And our bigger mission mm -hmm. is to increase consciousness and awareness of leaders. And it just happens to be safe to use the words high performance and leadership, but there's a higher mission. Yeah. And work's a really good entry point and to reach the people that maybe need it the most, which sometimes are the senior leaders. And then other times it's the team members. You need to go through the senior leaders and through the work and then the impacts of the work you guys do can ripple yeah. out. I think it'll be really interesting, especially, you know, I, I read a ton about uh, the economic conditions, specific like housing prices and education prices. It'll be really interesting to see how this work makes an impact as some of those things continue to change. Uh, curious, how did you guys initially get into this work and the, into these practices? Yeah. I mean, I can say for my own self, you know, my, my, uh, like the time was up for me on the old operating system I was running on, <laughs> you know, like I was a hard worker sick and tired and sick of being sick and tired. Yeah. I mean, I think it was a combination of things. I think I was always somebody who could really drive myself really hard. Um, learn to get ahead by being who I needed to be. Um, and you know, at some point in my thirties, like the, the, my inner being was both crying out uh, from exhaustion, but also from faking it. And, um, it wasn't sustainable because the energy that it takes to try to be somebody that you're not is, is, is massive. And then, like you said, Adam, like the conditions are changing. Just life is more complex. I don't think we have the energy to keep up the act as much as we did. And it's not producing the same, you know, level of results. Um, so there's that. And then, you know, I think also a byproduct of having worked in teams where I was working with, highly dysregulated leaders um, and just actually experiencing the ripple effects of being in organizations where there is this lack of awareness, lack of self-regulation and really seeing like the real damage that it caused to people downstream and prevented us from doing great work. Um, and being somebody who loves this kind of stuff, you know, it was really the signal for me, like, you know, it's so important that we, especially when we're, you know, managing team and we're leading people the stress that comes to people through work is it's like the number one stressor um it affects everything else so it really feels like there's a huge responsibility like not only so we can self-govern ourselves and create the lives that we want to um but you know i think more and more people are craving working in places where it actually feels good and supportive to our potential and isn't just a bunch of stress so that's what's really brought me to heart math and, and really excited to do more of this work. How about you, Jeff? Uh, mine was, uh, I grew up in a, I grew up with a bipolar mother, very violent sort of upbringing. And so I was really good at um, looking perfect to the external world. And, you know, I was fortunate. I had great jobs like in sports entertainment early on. And, but I realized every time I got promoted, I had, more of an imposter syndrome, right? Like you've heard it a million times, more anxiety, anger, stress. And I mean, honestly, wonder how I existed and got through the days. But my low point is my mom committed suicide and I hit rock bottom and I did not know how to move forward, but I got introduced to some of these tools and techniques. And, you know, some people describe it as my spiritual journey. I just didn't want to feel the way I was feeling. I mean, it was like surreal like just this human experience. Mm -hmm. So I started to even just do some of the simple things. Um, and I remember waking up probably three to six months after my mom's death and after being very committed to doing a lot of this work, I remember feeling somewhat present, some joy and like deep gratitude for the first time in my life. And I realized if I could go from totally disconnected to feeling this, anybody could. And it was really the motivation to start Paragon because 
it was like, how can we influence the most amount of people and the companies allow for that? So if we could help these senior leaders relate to themselves differently, they'd make better decisions for their families, their communities, their teams, corporations, and humanity. And, and we see it every day now. And everybody, we live in this separate world, but really we're all looking for connection. I mean, that's the irony. And, you know, there's systems in place from healthcare to politics that media, because we work with a lot of people, senior mm -hmm. people in these, division is a strategy. And so this next level of consciousness and what you're doing and what Kiki and I are doing are to move past those veils and bring people together because it's what we're craving. It's how we're designed. And it's how we can change the world. Thank you for sharing those stories, Jeff. You mentioned that you've heard stories like that before. I don't think we can hear enough of those stories because to your point, people are looking to transcend fear and live in freedom and have the capacity to pursue their potential. So thank you yeah. for sharing those stories and for the people you guys are impacting. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Before I let you go, what's the best way for people to keep up with both you and the work you're doing at Paragon? Absolutely. Yeah. You can follow us on LinkedIn. You can find us at performance, uh, Paragon Performance Evolution. Um, but if anyone's interested in having a chat, they can email me directly and it's kiki at performanceparagon.com. And that's K-I-K-I. Well, we'll have links to the Paragon website and your contacts in the show notes. But Jeff and Kiki, thank you so much for coming awesome. on the show. Thank you, Adam. Appreciate you. Thanks, Chris. Yes. Thank you for listening to Tuesdays and Morrissey. That conversation was with Kiki Federico and Jeff Benton of Paragon Performance. What I enjoyed about the episode was their framing of our performance as an operating system and how changing our internal states from stress to coherence can have a positive impact in our lives. If you enjoyed the show, share it with a friend and we'll see you here soon. Thank you. Thank you.